Good afternoon. Um, my name is Barb Tarnick and I manage continuing education and outreach for the Cool Climate Enology and Viticulture Institute here at Brock University. And I'd like to uh, say good afternoon and thank you for joining us here today. Today we welcome Dr. Tony Shaw, who is a professor here at Brock University in the Department of Geography, and he is also a Covey Fellow. He teaches courses principally in the areas of meteorology, applied climatology, and viticulture. His current areas of research include wine terroir, site selection methods for new vineyards, freeze protection methods, wind energy, building climatology, and climate change and impacts. He disseminates his research in a variety of forms, including refereed wine and climatology journals, technical reports, and conference proceedings. His current major research projects include determination of subappellation in Ontario's main wine regions, climatic assessment of new and emerging areas for the production of Vitis vinifera vines, and active freeze protection methods for vine and fruit crops. He also conducts research and has published in areas related to air pollution and building climatology and Latin American and Caribbean developmental issues. But today, he is here to talk to us about volatility in the evolving cool climate wine regions of Ontario. So please join me in welcoming Tony Shaw. Thank you, uh, first of all, to the live audience here and also to our larger audience or listening and watching on webcast. As you know, um, the topic of climate change is one that's been widely discussed in so many different uh, venues in newspaper, uh, in the social media, in the academic uh, journals and what have you. Of course, um, the debate regarding climate change is pretty much over. I mean, there's still a few skeptics who uh, still believe that we're not uh, in a climate change uh, mode. Uh, and of course, that perhaps climate change is, is not attributed to human activities, that is probably more likely a natural process. Um, I wouldn't get into that. My assumption here, of course, is that the climate is changing. And according to the IPCC, uh, that change is attributed primarily uh, to uh, human factors as a term you have to use anthropogenic uh, activities, industrial and what have you. So I like to look at climate change in the context of uh, viticulture uh, and in particular in the context of uh, the wine regions of Ontario, the so-called cool climate wine regions. Now, the topic, of course, is volatility. And for those of you who are uh, in the investment business uh, on the stock market, uh, you know that even as we speak today, uh, there's a high degree of volatility. And what's the volatility? Essentially, it's a, a major shift, for example, in this case here, in the shifts in temperature and precipitation uh, over a particular period. Uh, so it is, if you will, uh, volatility means high degree of variability uh, and of course in the case of climate, uh, fairly extreme uh, climatic events. And this is one of the things that probably um, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, uh, focuses on. Not so much that the climate is changing, we all know that. Uh, our grape growers and winemakers can actually um, adapt to the gradual change in climate. However, embedded within uh, these long-term uh, climate changes and fluctuations are these extreme uh, events. In, in some cases, we've seen uh, this past winter, or this particular winter, especially in the month of January and February, very, very low temperatures or extreme minimum temperatures. So these are the events actually that are damaging, uh, where the vulnerability is very, very high, the risks are very, very high. And if you look at the long-term trend in these uh, temperature and precipitation, uh, and the temperature precipitation data, as you will see in a moment, um, there are cases where the changes are fairly extreme. And this is what makes viticulture extremely 
susceptible, where the risks are very, very high. The question is, of course, how can we examine those trends and how can we actually even forecast uh, these trends and what could we do uh, within the industry to minimize the risk associated with especially extreme events. What are extreme climatic events? And I won't read through all this very quickly. And some of this information, of course, uh, is, uh, would be on the website. Uh, the, all the slides would be there. So for viewers and for those of you present, uh, this information, of course, you can access at any time and listen to it with a big glass of wine um, at your own convenience. So an extreme climatic event, of course, this of course has to do with the uh, where the threshold temperatures or threshold precipitation levels are exceeded. Extreme events are relatively sensitive to the variability. Now, this is why when we look at the climatic potential of an area, very often we use uh, means, uh, average, the average annual temperature, average growing season, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is a fairly descriptive statistic, um, and, but it doesn't say much about uh, the range. We are more concerned with the range or the extremes because uh, in risk management, uh, it's the extremes actually that are problematic. And as you know, uh, when you build sewer systems or when you build major infrastructure, you're more concerned with uh, the extremes, not so much the average. Average is, is a fairly useful statistics for a comparative purpose, but in terms of really uh, comprehensive assessment, uh, the extreme values are important. Extreme events, of course, are, def are defined by their impacts. And of course, um, in the case of viticulture, uh, we're looking, in this case, extreme temperatures, which we've seen um, made a significant impact in terms of vine, uh, vine kill, bud damage, and so on and so forth. Of course, uh, we don't know at this point in time the extent of the damage, but we know that we've had some fairly low th temperatures. Uh, we'll know, of course, uh, probably early in the spring when you have bud burst to extend to which uh, uh, these minimum temperatures affected uh, um, primary buds. Extreme events also are very memorable. And those are the ones, of course, that we remember. We don't remember uh, the gradual change in temperature, but remember those days when it's very hot, very cold, uh, and so on and so forth. But also, the last point that they may also form the primary climatic driver of adaptation strategies. So when we're looking at short-term and long-term adaptation strategies, we're really concerned with how we can minimize the risk, how we can reduce our vulnerability uh, in terms of the impact of those events. And so uh, we're not so much concerned, then, as I said, uh, with how things are changing in a gradual manner because the changes, the changes are slow. Uh, grape growers and winemakers are able to adapt quite readily. However, when these changes are dramatic and when they're very extreme, the chances are grape growers and winemakers are not able to make those dramatic changes in order to minimize risk. There are different ways of characterizing extreme events. If you're a statistician, you tend to look at the percentile, the extreme values, okay, the 90th and 10th percentile values. Those are the ones, of course, in a normal distribution, those are in the extreme, uh, uh, extreme end. Uh, in the case, of course, as we see uh, certain weather indices, and I'll be using a couple of uh, uh, climatic or bioclimatic indices, uh, just so that we have an idea of how the climate is changing uh, based on those particular indices. Okay. The area that I'm looking at, of course, uh, these are the, the three principal areas, of course, uh, uh, the three principal one appellations, uh, Niagara region, of course, uh, the, the big one, and followed by Lake Erie North Shore, uh, and of course, uh, Prince Edward County. And then there are a number of emerging areas, such as uh, uh, Norfolk County, uh, Gray County, and uh, Lake Huron County. Now, in this talk, I only have an hour, so I, I can't address all those areas, so I have to be very, very selective in terms of what I do. So what I'll do is I'll focus primarily on the Niagara region, because when we look at long-term trends in some of these climatic indices, uh, these trends are pretty much mirror uh, in the other areas. So the only difference, of course, is the magnitude of the change, whether it be temperature or precipitation. But the overall long-term trends are very much the same. Uh, you wouldn't find a significant difference uh, in terms of the uh, long-term temperature and precipitation changes. As, uh, okay, so 
One of the things that we are concerned about in climate change in terms of whether the potential is there for uh, extending the growing season is that we want to know uh, whether our spring is getting warmer. And I'll look at the spring and the fall. These are what we call the shoulder seasons. But they are very, very important because an early growing season and a late, uh, uh, late uh, fall, of course, is ideal because the longer the growing season, the greater the potential of varieties uh, will have to reach their, ripening, uh, their full ripening potential. So uh, what I'd like to do here then is to look at the extreme minimum temperature in the spring to see whether our spring is getting warmer. Now, I've looked at these three months, March, April, and May. And what I've done is I've gone to the data for each year, for each month, and uh, chose the coldest uh, temperature in that month to see how uh, that is changing in the course of the last four to five years. The data is from 1970 to actually 2015, February. And as you can see, um, May, of course, uh, there, is, there is some slight change. I mean, the, the change is not very pronounced. Uh, in the case of April, uh, April is showing a much stronger trend in terms of the increase uh, in the minimum temperature. Remember, we're dealing here with the coldest temperature, which of course, as you know, in the spring, uh, especially in the month of uh, April and May, is likely to cause uh, freeze damage uh, to uh, partially open buds or even open buds. So knowing uh, what those temperature thresholds are and whether those thresholds are actually increasing or decreasing is very useful in terms of determining whether our spring is getting warmer or is getting colder. Now, the one thing then I'd like you to see, uh, especially in the case of, uh, of March, and then for that matter, all the, all the three months, is that when we speak of the term volatility, volatility, of course, has to do with the changes from uh, one day to the next, one season to the next, one year to the next, in terms of uh, the magnitude, how extreme those changes are. So in the case of me, uh, we're seeing those changes are not very significant. In other words, you don't have a high degree of variability, but you can see in the case of uh, April, uh, fairly high, and of course, uh, certainly in March. Okay. So is the spring getting warmer? Well, if we look at things such as frost free days, I don't have all that information here because the study has been done to look at all these various climatic indices. Frost free days, of course, in Ontario in general is getting longer. And of course, the frost free season is one way in which we can judge the, the potential of an area in terms of its ability uh, to mature certain varieties, whether it be early season, mid season, or late season varieties. Okay, so the next thing then, I look at the growing season. And for the growing season, this is why I don't like about this particular strategy. Bear with me one second here. Um, okay, can you see that there? Yeah. So what I'm looking at here is the growing degree days, heat units. And of course, <clears throat> for those of you, I mean, for viticulture, this is quite standard. You use 10 degrees as a base, and you subtract uh, that from the mean temperature and gives you the number of growing degrees uh, for that particular day, and then it's simply accumulated for the season. So what I've done then, of course, the uh, growing degree day is probably one of the most prominent climatic uh, index used in assessing the potential of an area and assessing the uh, potential for certain varieties to reach your full ripening uh, capability. So what you see here then is, first of all, in the Period from 1970 to roughly to the early 80s, uh, you find that the variation from one year to the next is not as pronounced. Okay, in other words, you don't see a significant change in the total number of heat units from one year to the next. But as you get beyond the uh, 1985 onwards into 2014 you can see then that there is significant variation from one year to the next. This is what we call vintage variation. In other words, no two years are the same. Okay, uh, And this is what we mean by what we said, variability or volatility. In other words, you have one extreme to the other, and I have these as vintage years, and I'll, I'll talk a bit, a bit about that. The vintage years, of course, especially for reds, in particular red varieties, uh, 
Um, there's no clear definition of what a vintage is, but we use a couple of criteria, and one of, uh, some of those criteria, of course, are the growing degrees. If you have growing degrees, for example, in Niagara region greater than 1600, uh, in a com combination of relatively dry conditions, especially in the latter part of September and October, then you may have certain red varieties reaching their full ripening potential, well balanced, highest, uh, low acidity to some extent, or medium level acidity, but good sugar levels. And so what we're seeing then is that some years, yes, uh, very, very high uh, accumulation of heat units, but as you can see, very, very low. Okay, and this is one of the things which is not just only characteristic of Ontario, but it's actually found worldwide. The, on a worldwide basis, we're seeing more extremes in the weather, more extremes in climate, and using these various indices, then we're also seeing this kind of uh, variability. And this is a major concern for uh, grape growers and particular wine makers, because you know, you, when you make wine, you aim for good quality, but also consistency. And as I mentioned uh, in another talk, uh, uh, when you're coming out with a first wine, uh, the first impression, of course, is very important in a market which is very, very uh, fairly um, crowded in terms of wines. Uh, so your first impression, your first wine has to be, or five first wines have to be very good. Uh, very often, you never get a chance to make a second impression. So this is what's uh, one of the challenges for the growers. And of course, my new wine uh, makers uh, already have certain uh, strategies that they can use uh, for uh, dealing with vintage variation. Uh, we'll talk about that later on, um, but just to address then some of these issues. This is, I took a, a selection of years to look at a number of so-called vintage years uh, for Niagara, okay, and and all I've done is plot the heat units, the distribution of the heat units during the growing season. Because as you know, one of the things I've always mentioned is that total heat units very good in judging the potential of an area, but also more importantly is how those heat units are distributed during the growing season. The growing season uh, typically is defined as the beginning of April to the end of uh, October officially. Okay, that's the official, uh, if you will, length of the growing season for comparative purposes. But as you know, um, when we talk about a meteorological uh, spring, a meteorological spring uh, as opposed to a calendar spring, you may have the date of spring starts on March 21st, but it doesn't necessarily mean that all of a sudden the temperatures will warm up. You could have winter-like conditions. So there is a difference there, okay? Uh, however, we, for a comparative purpose, we use these seven months, and as you can see, uh, those are the years then where we have uh, heat units greater than 1,600 growing degree days. But one thing I want you to note is that the greatest variability during those seasons occur at this time, roughly between June, July, and August. Uh, not a great deal of variation in terms of the onset or the beginning in the month of March and uh, rather April and May, or neither in September or October, but usually uh, in the month of, sorry, uh, in the month of July, June, July, and August, and especially July, uh, June, July, August, uh, until lesser extent September. Okay. So another thing that I don't can address in this presentation is not just the variability from one year to the next. Okay, it's variability within the season, and that can have a very big impact on the on wine quality, grape quality, um, in terms of how vines mature. So you would expect then a gradual increase in temperature uh, followed by a gradual decrease, but very often that does not happen. So probably uh, for a much finer analysis uh, of the climatic conditions of the area, rather than just looked at uh, variation from one year to the next, but also variation within the season. But that in itself is another talk. Okay. So if you're concerned then about um, the threshold uh, heat units, as you can see then, over the last four to five years, this is a maximum received by the Niagara region. Uh, this is the average, and this is the minimum. So this is the range then, if you will, uh, within which uh, you have the distribution of heat units over a four or five year period. This is very good statistics for long-term planning. So if you're looking at the variety then, and you're looking at the required heat units, you have some idea what the minimum is, 
uh, what the maximum is for the most part, and what the average is, and if you have an agreed amount in terms of uh, that's necessary to ripen a particular variety, then you have a number of years uh, uh, in which those varieties would likely reach their full uh, potential. And this is just another way of looking at variability, is to take the mean and then uh, look at how each year uh, the values deviate from that mean. Okay, so it's another uh, statistical tool, a relatively simple statistical tool, uh, but represents graphically uh, the kinds of uh, variation that you can see. So one good thing, one good thing is that if we look at this, uh, in this period here, uh, notice that we have more of a cooling trend. In other words, the heat units were much lower uh, in the period preceding 1988, and then they tend to be much higher in the subsequent period, okay? But with some degree, again, with variability, even though in general, or what is what it suggests then here, uh, in general, is that overall, uh, the climate of the Niagara region is warming, and so we're seeing accumulation of greater number of heat units. Something that I should have pointed out to you early on in this diagram here uh, is that very quickly, uh, the region one, region two, and region three, region one is a, a region in the Winkler classification uh, with heat units relative less than a thousand. And this is, this, if you will, the, the the true cool climate region, uh, where certain varieties such as Pinot Noir and, and Riesling and so on and so forth are likely to ripen uh, with fairly well balanced acidity. But if you notice then, what's happening when we talk about evolving clim uh, climatic region, evolving means the area is moving from what we previously conceive as a totally cool climate region, but it's evolving from a cool area to a warmer area, okay? So, and so the suitability of some varieties uh, is somewhat threatened, okay? Uh, so this is something that we have to pay attention to, uh, is that overall the climate is changing and to some extent that then could uh, certainly affect the, the type of varieties that can be grown successfully. And this is just another statistical way of representing it, uh, where you have all the, the data is distributed heat units and giving more or less a normal curve, and so these are the extremes that we tend to pay attention to. But if you're looking at the, as I said, the frequency of uh, years with uh, heat units greater than 1400, as you can see, the majority uh, is much, is greater than 14. In fact, this diagram here is probably a much better diagram to use. Um, as we can see, roughly 70% of the years have heat units greater than 1,400 growing degree years. More than 70% of the years, in other words, of the four to five years we've looked at, 70% of those years have heat units uh, greater than 1,400 growing degree days. So for, for uh, grape growers and winemakers looking and assessing the potential of the area uh, in terms of what varieties are likely to reach uh, their greatest potential, that is very useful statistics. In spite of the fact, however, as I said, that you still do uh, have some variation from one year to the next. Okay. Then I looked at the other area. Um, this is, and I'm not going to spend too much time in um, Lake Erie North Shore. Uh, looking secondly at Lake Erie North Shore. Lake Erie North Shore is an area uh, which is seen, which is probably the warmest area of the three wine regions in Ontario. Uh, Lake Erie North Shore is the warmest. But what we're seeing is that Lake Erie North Shore, uh, in the majority of the years, right, uh, it's in region two and three. In other words, these are warm climate regions, okay? Uh, it's not most of the years, except for a few, uh, it's not within the uh, cool climate. In other words, uh, it's not uh, it's, it's greater than 1,400 growing degree days, okay, much greater. And in fact, but again, all three areas, including, um, as I mentioned, uh, Prince Edward County, all three areas are showing this kind of uh, trend, this kind of volatility from one year to the next. Okay. And again, the same uh, type of graph that shows uh, the maximum number of heat units for this area 
the minimum here is roughly 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 thirteen hundred degree degrees, and the average roughly is about fifteen hundred and twenty six. That's the average. As I said, the average is uh, is just a simple statistic, but you can see then the variability below and above that average as we look at this diagram here. Okay. So. What are the challenges for viticulture, as we see later on? The challenge, of course, is that um, you do have, uh, to some extent, an adequate number of heat units for the most part. But each year, uh, those numbers, of course, will vary, uh, uh, which could then uh, vary the, uh, the quality and, of course, the, the style of wine. And the last one, of course, and I won't spend too much time, this is, uh, this is Prince Edward County. Prince Edward County, of course, uh, is the one area with the lowest number of heat units. Okay, um, so this is typically then uh, nothing. Uh, one year it went to roughly fifteen hundred, but everything is below fourteen hundred degrees. Okay, so this is your, if you will, your typical cool climate wine region, uh, where principally varieties such as Riesling, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir. Uh, are likely to do better. Uh, varieties such as Cabernet or Sauvignon might have a difficult time because it requires much higher level of heatiness, and certainly varieties such as Syrah will don't stand a chance to reach any uh, any potential there. Okay. And again, uh, just to give you a clue, uh, same degree of variability uh, uh, from one year to the next, but uh, higher uh, higher heatiness uh, above average, if you will. Uh, in the latter part, uh, beginning from the uh, 1990s onwards, okay, except for a few years. Okay, now, so that's the, if you will, the trend, uh, looking at how the uh, heat units are changing, how temperatures change. Because temperature, of course, is, uh, is a key variable in most of the studies on climate change, not say that precipitation is not. We have much more reliable temperature data than we do uh, precipitation, also a much longer record of temperature than we do of precipitation. Um, so can we use then, uh, for example, in the stock market, it said that past performance is no guarantee of future returns. In other words, what happens in the past doesn't necessarily mean that those uh, conditions repeat themselves. But nonetheless, uh, if we were to look at trends, sometimes something called a persistent uh, forecast. A persistent forecast is a forecast in which the present conditions okay, are likely to persist into the future. Okay? Uh, we don't know how far that might be, but certainly it gives some, some indication, uh, certainly in the short term, of what conditions are likely to do or be. But also, we can make some forecasts using uh, uh, some modeling studies, and so we've looked at uh, general circulation models. Um, and we use a number of scenarios. Uh, there are three scenarios. Um, in other words, the first one is increasing population, slower and fragmented technological change. In other words, uh, in other words uh, uh, conditions persist. In other words, the same conditions we experience now, those conditions are likely uh, to persist in the next 30, 40 years. Okay, so in other words, it's business as usual. And then we have the intermediate situation uh, where we do have some improvement in technology that will reduce greenhouse gases. We have a reduction in population, and of course, also some other uh, factors that tend to ameliorate climate change. And then, of course, we have uh, the best case scenario, and that is population goes down quite dramatically. We have a tremendous development in array of energy saving technology and reduction of fossil fuel. And also we have a more equitable distribution of wealth across the globe. As you know, one of the big problems with climate change is the degree of vulnerability differs from one country to the other. And even within countries, uh, levels of vulnerability uh, vary depending on the economic, social economic status of, of people okay, and regions. Okay. So, in looking at uh, the forecast, then we look at the A1B uh, scenario because this one seemed a bit more realistic. In other words, uh, we won't sit on our laurel and try to do something about climate change. Okay, so we've done uh, we've used general circulation models. Uh, this, this is the Hadley model, and uh, this work, of course, is uh, some of this work is done by Dr. Adam Fennick. I don't. 
Dr. Adam Fennick was uh, with Environment Canada, and he's done a lot of studies on, on climate modeling. He's currently at the University of Prince Edward Island, and he still continues to do work, and so we collaborate in some of this uh, work uh, in terms of climate modeling. So what he has done here is to do a projection of what's likely to happen to uh, growing degree days uh, over the next, uh, well, over the next 50 years. Um, and so what we have here, this here, is the actual heat units uh, from 1977 to roughly 2014. And this is a projection of what could happen uh, given uh, various, the three various scenarios. So this probably is a better diagram to look at. Uh, so we looked at the, sorry, that's not the, let's see. Yeah, stick with this one here, one second. So we have the three scenarios. As you can see then, uh, if we were to look at the one in the middle here, uh, this is the actual growing degree days based on these two normal periods, 1971-2000 and 1981-2010. That's, that's the new normal period. The normal period, of course, for, for some of our non-climatologists is a period of roughly 30 consecutive years. And the, the main data for that year is what we call the normal uh, average. So, as you can see then, um, in, in all three scenarios, the, over the next, uh, let's say we take a look at 19 and to 2020, so in the next uh, roughly six years, we could see uh, the growing degree days, the average growing degree days are reaching, in this case, it's closer to 1600, and then going up, up, up. So that's the scenario, okay? In other words, then, we're moving away, if conditions uh, were to persist, we're moving away from a relatively cooler area to one that will be much, much warmer. And over 2,000 heat units, this puts us actually uh, in the same category at this point in time as uh, Northern California, in particular, the Napa Valley area. Okay, Napa, of course, is well renowned for its red wine, uh, Bordeaux style. Uh, so this is the projection, if, as I said, if things were to continue uh, in terms of uh, uh, any of the three uh, scenarios described. Now, so that's the growing season conditions. I want to look at next then, um, are what's happening to extreme temperatures in the other shoulder period, and that's in the fall, because it's the, the fall period, of course, is very crucial for us, uh, especially the month of September and October. And because uh, that period, of course, is what determines uh, the quality of the wine, good balance between sugar and acid. And of course, for reds, uh, the, the longer the fall, the better the chances. Some varieties, such as Cabernet Sauvignon, Cap Franc, and to some extent, Merlot, even though Merlot is a, more of a mid season variety, but the two varieties, Cap Franc and Cabernet Sauvignon, these are late season varieties. And we do have some problems to some extent with these varieties in reaching their full potential mainly because sometimes uh, our fall temperatures uh, is, or, or the fall season is cut off quite dramatically by a frost. So I wanted to find out then uh, whether we are seeing an extension of the fall period, whether we are seeing uh, these low temperatures that are likely then to, uh, if you will, uh, result in what we call the end of the frost-free season um, and beginning of the cold temperatures mark in the dormancy period. So I looked at these three months, and this looks good. Uh, we see in the case of September, uh, September, the lowest temperature, of course, uh, is getting higher. So the extreme minimum temperature, uh, or the lowest temperature observed for each month in the month of September is getting warmer. Uh, October, probably not to the same extent. And of course, uh, uh, November, nothing at all, okay? But again, uh, fluctuation from one year to the next. But this is this bodes well. I, I would I would wish actually if October was a bit warmer, uh, because September temperature for the most part, uh, the latter part of uh, September, of course, uh, temperatures can uh, uh, drop off quite dramatically. Even though you may not have a frost, uh, you may not have any significant uh, accumulation of heat for photosynthesis. So the frost day is can be misleading to some extent, whether it's a late and early season, the question is, do we have enough 
heat units during the month of September and October uh, that would allow these varieties to reach their full ripening potential. Then, of course, the next thing I do then is look at the growing sea, uh, the winter. For us in Canada, winter temperatures are probably the number one limiting factor in terms of where we can successfully grow grapes on a consistent basis. And what we're finding with climate change is that, yes, there has been some moderation. Uh, in the temperature, but I'll explain to you in a moment that even though the, the lowest temperatures at which we're likely to have vine damage, those temperatures are getting higher and we're seeing less uh, frequent numbers, uh, what we're finding as we see in a moment is the volatility within the season, not the volatility from one year to the next, but within the season. And that in itself uh, poses another threat or another problem. In the same way I said we need to look at the volatility or the variability within the growing season rather than simply looking at one parameter within the growing season, we need to know how things are distributed within the growing season. And similarly then within the winter, uh, if we are really concerned with assessing the risk of an area, uh, it's not just enough to know that how many times the temperature fall below a certain threshold, but also how the temperature actually varies within that particular month or or winter period, uh, because that in itself is a very it's an important clue. Okay. So what I've done here then is to look at the, first of all, the short-term volatility. And you can appreciate that this particular winter, the month of January and February, they've had some pretty dreadful temperatures, unfortunately for our growers. Um, these temperatures, of course, as you can see, uh, this is what we mean by volatility, short-term volatility. If you're in a stock market, you can see that your stock can actually dramatically change price in the course of several hours, days, or weeks, right? Uh, so what we're seeing here, that within the growing season, the temperature can reach uh, as much as, uh, make this a bit solid, can reach as much as zero degree, and uh, of course, in the case of uh, Prince Edward County can go down to as low as 32. So you have a 32 degree range, okay? Um, and that's not good because when varieties experience moderately warm temperatures, especially in the month of uh, February, latter part of February, um, their cold tolerance, of course, diminishes uh, as the variety moves into the latter part of winter completed their dormancy, and for the most part then, they can be, um, become less tolerant at warmer temperatures. And when those temperatures then fall below, at, 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 if you will, a damaging threshold, that's when you have some serious problem. And that's what we're seeing within this particular, this particular winter. We not only have very low temperatures, but we have variation from one day to the next, one week to the next. And that is the, if you will, the, the threat that's not only faced by us here in Canada, but that is the problem we are facing uh, in terms of climate change extremes. Uh, this is what the insurance companies are concerned about. They're concerned about risk uh, extreme, because when, you, uh, when you're insuring people, you don't, in of course, the insurance company love to insure people with low risk because then they don't have any claims and they collect their money, okay? All well and good but you don't want to insure people with a high level of risk where every day they're sending in claim or every year claim for your basement flooded. Okay, uh, you don't want that. You have two choices, either increase your premium or you refuse to give them insurance. And that's becoming a problem in many areas of the world where the risks are very, very high and they become very frequent. So the new risk for us here um, is that we are seeing not only the changes that you are seeing in a moment, the uh, fluctuation one year to the next in terms of extreme temperatures, but within the season then, we are seeing uh, a great deal of variability. And so what we'll find later on, uh, and I'll expand on this here. This is just an example of the spatial distribution in, in temperature. 
uh, for February 15 and 16. As you can see, uh, this area here, uh, in the Narragana Lake area, uh, seem to have relatively milder temperatures in comparison to Western Catharines, where temperatures can drop, in this case, is minus, minus 31, uh, minus 32. Um, so those are very, very lethal temperatures. Um, so in addition to the fact that we do have the variability within the season, we do have these very, very low temperatures, and minus 32, um, sorry to say that uh, quite inevitable that you'll have some damage. Um, and I'm, I, I'm very sympathetic to the growers because this is a very, very, it's been a very, very difficult winter uh, from that standpoint. Uh, this is Lake Erie North Shore. Um, we don't have as many climatic stations because it's not a very big area in terms of grape production. It's a big area spatially, but in terms of number of acreages, uh, relatively small in comparison to the Niagara region, which is the biggest area. And of course, Prince Edward County, they have the same issue as well, just on those two days, just to give you some indication of what's happening. So the same weather system, of course, affects us here in Southern Ontario, but depending on your location, uh, the magnitude of the change can be quite different. So in viticulture, and with most types of uh, temperature sensitive crops, uh, location, location, location is very important. Uh, in the first instance when you decide to go into this business here. So the other thing then is what I've done is to look at the, the temperature, the lowest temperature for these uh, three months of January, February, March. And again, as you can see, um, this here, If you look at January, as you can see, January is, and this, this is, by the way, this is the Niagara region, okay? Um, and one point I wish to make, and that is, the reason why I chose the Vineland Station, um, because the Vineland Station in the Niagara region, uh, and in, in the viticulture area, the Vineland Station has the longest and probably the most reliable record uh, in Niagara, and it's a station that's located, for the most part, in a viticulture area. We don't have long-term data uh, outside of Vianna. We do have data for Welland, but Welland, of course, is an urban station, and outside of the viticulture area, uh, we do have data for, for Niagara Falls and for Terry. But the Vianna station, of course, is the station we're using. Um, the important thing that I wish to make is that the Vianna station may not necessarily reflect the lowest temperature, because uh, the, the microclimate, uh, with, or the microclimates, there are high degree of microclimate variation within the viticulture area. And so uh, on a night with frost, some areas might experience much lower temperatures. I've shown you in the, in the uh, diagram for uh, February 15 and 16, so please bear that in mind. Uh, so what we're looking at here are two things. One of our, not just the magnitude of the temperature change, but the overall trend. Okay. So that trend uh, would be the same for all the, all the other stations. Uh, the difference, of course, is that the magnitude of that change would be different. Okay. So what we're seeing then is that overall, the temperature is increasing. In other words, the occurrence of minimum temperature below minus 20, we use minus 20 degrees uh, as the threshold temperature. Now, um, again, they are, Winter damage depends on different threshold temperatures. Uh, in other words, minus 20 in the month of January and February may not have any problem. If minus 20 occurs in the early part or latter part of December, you do have a problem. If minus 20 occurs in, a lot of, in early March, mid-March, you do have a problem. So as we see, uh, when we look at these different thresholds, we have to look at it in relationship to the, the phenology of the vine, the stage at which the vine is in terms of dormancy, because uh, the risk tolerance of these varieties varies with uh, time. Uh, the longer the time uh, in terms of uh, the completion of dormancy, the greater the risk of the variety. But um, we can't do that, I don't have the time to do all of that, uh, so we use minus 20 uh, and lower as a threshold at which you're likely to have some damage, especially to the primary bud, because that's the bud which is most sensitive to low temperatures. Okay. So does it 
bode well? To some extent it does, but again, I want you to see that the fluctuation is fairly significant. And uh, I look at it for uh, <clears throat> the January trends and January temperature. The January temperature gain overall trend is, uh, is an increasing trend, uh, even though we do have this fluctuation, but overall, uh, in other words, the temperature is getting warmer. But this diagram here is probably more instructive. So what I've done is I look at the frequency of occurrences of temperature uh, below minus 20. And so you can see then why you could be easily fooled into thinking, well, yes, the climate is warming. Uh, if you look at the overall trend and you put a curve here, you will see that uh, over the last uh, 40 years, uh, in this time here, we didn't have, at that particular station, a lot of days with uh, temperatures below minus 20. Okay, we had a very short period here, nothing significant, uh, nothing significant. But here, okay, notice that, and this is the last two years. Okay, this is the last two, nine, the, the winter of 2014, uh, and of course, the present winter, uh, those are the two winters uh, where we've had some damage. We've had some uh, freeze damage last year, and unfortunately, uh, our growers are experienced, or likely, I, I hope, uh, I'd like to be very optimistic that uh, the damage will not be very severe. Uh, last year, the damage is still able to get a reasonably good crop. Uh, we don't know. As I said, um, I wouldn't want to make any um, assessment because it's everything, who knows, if you start praying, maybe things might change, right? But this is a situation here, okay? Um, as we can see, for that particular location in Vinan, there are 10 days with temperatures below minus 10, uh, minus 20, and went down as low as minus 23 at that particular location. But we know that elsewhere it went down as low as minus 28. Okay. So overall, um, it doesn't look too bad, except for this period of time. So we're hoping that next year uh, we won't see this, and that the trend for the next 10, 15 years will be one in which we'll continue to see a decline in damaging temperatures in the winter months. Now, we did do some statistical, some, again, some forecasting uh, using the general circulation model. Uh, it's called downscaling, statistical downscaling. And we tried to project what's likely to happen uh, over the next 30, 40 years. Let's say 30 years. 40 years, uh, I think 30 years is a more realistic uh, period to look at because if you're planting a vineyard now, it will be around hopefully the next 30 years. Okay. Uh, 20 years might be also good because it gives us some time to make some, uh, some prevent, take some preventative action. But overall picture in terms of uh, damaging temperatures, in terms of the long-term forecast is a good one. In other words, we may not see um, as many uh, uh, days uh, in the winter with damaging temperatures below minus uh, 20. Okay. So um, that's hopefully is, but again, remember, we're dealing with climate change. While in one hand, we're benefiting from a, a melt milder temperature, there are other environmental uh, problems that may be associated with climate change, okay, in terms of the buildup of greenhouse gases. So for Canada, the benefits are mixed. In some cases, uh, we will benefit. In some areas, we may lose out. And I just tossed in this diagram here. <clears throat> this is outside of the viticulture area. This is well, and as you can see, uh, well, uh, typically gets in the uh, winter months temperatures as low as minus 29 degrees. Okay. So the Niagara region, of course, is, does not have a homogeneous climate, and there's no uh, surprise that much of our viticultural activities tend to be confined to the area uh, below the escarpment, uh, where the moderating effect of Lake Ontario in winter months is probably most important factor. Okay, and the next thing that I look at is the growing season uh, precipitation. Uh, the, again, the growing season, the period from April to October, one of the good things about the Niagara region as far as precipitation is concerned is that uh, based on the actual data that we have over the last four to five years, there are relatively few years where you have very low precipitation, and those dry years actually correspond to very high uh, growing degree days, and you tend to have great red wines. 
So uh, period of low uh, season precipitation combined with relatively modern, uh, moderate temperature is actually ideal because uh, grapes, of course, don't like uh, extreme temperatures or extreme precipitation. Moderate uh, temperatures and moderate precipitation levels are, are actually the ideal conditions. So as far as the growing season precipitation, again, this is a total. We take the, all the precipitation per month of uh, April through to October. Um, and uh, we add those up, and uh, for the most part, um, if you ask the question, so what is the uh, required, or what would be an adequate uh, number of, uh, of millimeters of precipitation for a decent crop, the, some of the study, it varies. Uh, the reason for that, of course, is uh, precipitation, actual precipitation is a very good indicator, but the actual soil condition is very important because you can have soils that are not uh, uh, fairly deep, well-drained soil, so you don't have good storage of moisture. Uh, so the soil condition is very important in, as well as precipitation. But the, the point at this point is, that the point I'm trying to make here is that at this point in time, the, we don't seem to see any major trend in precipitation. It's not an increasing, if in the top thing at all, it's not a decreasing one. There's a slight increase in the amount of precipitation as we'll see. And that's the variability. Uh, for precipitation from one year to the next, it's not as pronounced as the temperature. Okay, uh, we do have some few instances here where abnormally high precipitation and abnormally low, but for the most part, the variability about the mean here is not a very, very uh, strong one. In other words, in order, we're not seeing extremes in precipitation. Okay, however, we are seeing uh, an increase in a number of days with precipitation, with measurable precipitation. Okay. Uh, and that is a concern for us, especially as we get into the month of, um, just a quick projection. Uh, again, we use the, the Hadley model and use a statistical downscaling to look at the precipitation for Vineland. I didn't do it, don't have the time to do it for, we've done this for all the regions, of course, in Ontario, including emerging areas, but I just want to focus here on, on, the, on the Niagara area. So overall, we could see uh, some increase in precipitation, uh, nothing dramatic, uh, so that bodes well. This is, as I said, situation as normal. If we don't do anything about climate change, we don't do anything about greenhouse gases, and I don't think that's likely to happen for the next four years, that we will do something, we're already doing something. Uh, so I think this scenario might be the one more likely where you, where you have a mixture of technology and we're moving towards a more equitable distribution of wealth and, and sharing of the environmental impact, helping the developing countries, the poor societies to come up to the same level. Uh, so hopefully that's the, a more optimistic scenario. So I think that we perhaps will see then uh, no dramatic change in precipitation for the Niagara region. Okay, this is, this is not the trend in many of the other countries. In fact, they, uh, in Southern Europe, in the Mediterranean area of France, Italy, uh, Spain, uh, um, California, Australia, they're very, very concerned about declining precipitation. That's the number one limitation to viticulture at this point in time, is very, very low precipitation accompanied by very high temperatures. The scenario for Ontario, and for that matter for much of Canada, is that we are not seeing major trend in precipitation. We're seeing significant changes, on the other hand, uh, in temperature, but not so much in precipitation. So what I've done then is to look at the precipitation for individual months. And what is of concern for us here is, as I said, May, June, July, not a problem. You can have lots of rain. Of course, the only problem, of course, is you may have some frequent uh, problems with fungal diseases. And so you have to spray more frequently. But for in terms of wine quality, uh, usually uh, the temperature the precipitation month of August and September and October. Uh, ideally, you like to have relatively drier conditions uh, in those months, and we're seeing then, in the case of August, some declining trend in the precipitation amount, uh, a slight increase in the month of September. And this is unfortunate because, uh, as we'll see in a moment, the number of days with precipitation in September is increasing. Okay. Um, and similarly, when we look at October, we're not seeing any major change in our, so that's, sorry, this is a total for September and October. 
Um, so this is yeah, this is October. So October we're seeing again an increase in trend in the amount of precipitation. As you know, last year it was not been a very good year. We've had a relatively cool season and cool wet season. So in that time, at that time of the year, September and October, uh, uh, this is one of the concerns that we have uh, with, uh, with moisture levels, is that we tend to have a little bit higher moisture levels, uh, which then can, to some extent, interfere with quality in terms of sugar levels and so on and so forth. So in terms of then, in terms of the precipitation level, uh, the total is not increasing, but this is why I said to you, when we look, we need to look at individual months to see how things are distributed during the growing season, which is more insightful than simply looking at totals. But we can only do so much in a short period of time. I also look at the frequency of days with precipitation uh, between 11 to 30 millimeter, because anything less than 10 really not of significance. Um, it might have problems in terms of fungal diseases, but, uh, uh, but in terms of soil moisture, not a significant addition to soil moisture. 11 to 30 millimeters, we're seeing a slight increase in trend, okay? And also, when we look at, when we talk about extreme precipitation amounts, 30 to 50, uh, nothing major, uh, pretty much the same, but a lot of variability from one year to the next. Not the same degree in this time here, but earlier on. Uh, and of course, very extreme precipitation, greater than 50 millimeters. Um, we're not seeing uh, a great deal of variation. Okay. Um, so we have these occasional two periods. For the most part, we're not seeing, um, if you will, uh, very, very intense precipitation. I also did uh, some studies on the number of days with precipitation, okay, because the number of days uh, with precipitation, if you have two, three days with precipitation, that in itself is not good. Uh, I don't have the statistics here, but um, that information has been compiled for all the wine regions. So, what are my conclusions? The implications, a trend towards warmer winters, but, uh, winter damage could actually increase in Ontario wine regions due to an increase in the frequency of warm freeze thaw events followed by cold snaps. So while the overall temperatures are increasing, uh, the problem is you have a period of prolonged warm temperatures followed by a cold snap and you have a problem. So that's the, and that's, as I said, it's, it's more important, it's more insightful looking at the temperature changes within the growing season, and not only from one year to the next, but within the growing season, because that tells us also about the susceptibility within that particular season, as opposed to just one year to the next. So it's not that the data is mutually exclusive, we need both sets of information. So I would suspect then, one of the things that could be done is to look at the variability uh, within the season, uh, the growing season, and of course, uh, uh, in the winter as well, especially in the month of December, January, February, and March. Okay. Also, um, warmer growing season and an evolution of the climate and possibly expansion into new areas. This is something that we are seeing already. We're seeing uh, uh, new areas coming on stream. Not, uh, I don't think the growers are jumping with both feet. And certainly after this winter, they might be a little bit cautious, uh, but certainly, um, the, there are opportunities for the industry to expand because one of the things that you try to do in reducing risk is to diversify. Uh, as you know, if you're in the stock market, you're in the mutual funds, you tend to have a fairly wide range of portfolios uh, to reduce your risk. But that in itself is not necessarily the best strategy because the greater the diversification, the more you have to attend to different areas of risk. So sometimes that in itself uh, is not the best strategy. But nonetheless, it does help. That's the strategy used by many people, not only in uh, Ontario or Canada, but many of the growers elsewhere are looking at diversification of both varieties and areas to minimize risk. Uh, more volatility in the growing season conditions lead to a greater degree of variability in vintages. So we're seeing that as you, as I, you notice that uh, from one year to the next. But again, I think our growers are, are certainly the winemakers are coping with that 
And this is something that's been done now in Europe and in terms of uh, blending. Wines are blended uh, from one area uh, with wines from another area. And also some of the big corporate wineries are actually looking at, uh, looking at different areas, especially places like Australia and, and, and of course uh, Spain, where the climate is, rock, is rapidly warming up. They're looking at other areas uh, uh, to produce wine, especially going up to higher elevation. So um, those are conditions, uh, there's some ways in which you can reduce volatility. Uh, by simply looking at different areas, blending wines, and of course your own viticulture practices uh, within uh, your vineyard. Uh, we know that one of the things that with some growers try to do is to have uh, not only uh, variations in terms of uh, wine areas, but also varieties, to diversify the range of varieties. There is a tendency uh, to shift to to few commercial varieties, that in itself is a risk, but remember, um, winemakers and growers, they're trying to balance on one hand uh, the requirements of a climate with that of the market. So those are two forces that are very, very difficult uh, uh, to actually um, to master. You know, what goes on in the vineyard and what goes on in the market. Uh, because what, grow, what can, your vineyard can grow is not necessarily what the market requires. So, and the market is very fickle. Okay, so those are some of the things that, some of the risks that uh, uh, we have to address as part of climate change, but also part of the risk in terms of viticulture. So I've added some, I've, I've just listed a few things here, and I wouldn't spend too much time. Diversify the range of cold resistant varieties. The growers are already doing that. The, I have to say our grape growers are very, very um, informed uh, in terms of what's happening in the region, what's happening outside, so it's not as if uh, they are not aware of it. Um, uh, site selection, of course, becomes very crucial. And I think this becomes, as you know, uh, it's not just because the area is expanding or the potential for new areas opening up. We need to be very, very uh, vigilant in terms of how we go about assessing these areas. Uh, so while the opportunities are there for new areas to, uh, to enter the industry, I think we have to do uh, do due diligence in terms of how we assess those areas in terms of the varieties suitable and the risks that are involved. Invest in freeze protection technology, growers are already doing that, but remember that in itself is not a saver, savior. Uh, unfortunately, with uh, wind machines, uh, unless you have a fairly strong inversion, the machines are not effective. So uh, those are some of the things that, that growers are already doing. Um, invest in crop insurance, uh, I might add, this is becoming a very big issue uh, in terms of climate change vulnerability and impacts. Because as you know, uh, for example, if you're in California, not California, if you're in Florida, it's difficult now to get flood insurance and hurricane insurance because of the frequency of, of hurricanes. Uh, and this is becoming an issue, especially for people who are the poor farmers. Uh, the wealthy can afford it, but the poor cannot afford insurance. And if the risks are increasing, then it becomes very difficult for those people to get insurance. So nonetheless, uh, I've explored some of the types of insurance uh, used by uh, farmers, not only in Canada, but in many of the developing countries as well. It's something called uh, index-based insurance, and that is you have certain climatic indices, and the insurance will pay out if that indice is exceeded or is below. Okay, so. You don't necessarily have to have damage. Uh, it's agreed upon that, let's say, if you require 1,500 growing degree days to mature, let's say, uh, Cabernet Franc, and in that particular year, you only receive 300 growing degree days, then you'll be compensated. Uh, if you receive 1,600, well, you're okay, unless it goes to a very high level and becomes damaging. So that is one way in which the growers are able then to even out the, 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 the extremes in terms of income. And that's becoming a very, very important uh, index or the, these so-called uh, climatic indices uh, in terms of uh, insurance, uh, as opposed to indemnity insurance. Indemnity insurance is you pay out if there's a damage. If, if your basement floods, somebody comes and assess it, and you get compensated uh, based on indemnity insurance. Index-based insurance, a little bit different. Uh, we've done some studies on that, and that is probably one of the things that some growers may have to uh, look into, especially if we continue to see this kind of volatility. Invest in uh, weather forecasting systems at the micro level. 
As you know, Environment Canada provides macro level forecasts. Uh, and as we've seen in the case of sub Appalachian, you've seen how dramatic, dramatically different the temperatures are. Uh, we, they, it's not okay, it's not just enough to have monitors there telling you what the temperature is. Uh, but if, this, if there are uh, ways in which we can actually try to determine, uh, even a couple of days ahead, what the likelihood of the temperature would be in some of these uh, areas, it might be helpful uh, to the growers. Uh, we do have the vinyl alert system, and that's, that's worked really well. It informs the growers uh, in terms of when they can turn the machine off and so on and so forth. But that is actually what we call no casting. No casting is actually telling you what the information is at that point. We want forecasting. We want to have the information ahead of time because then that would uh, give growers a bit more time uh, and probably ways to which they can actually deal with the issue uh, that's impending. So those are just some of the things that I recommend. As I said, um, with climate change, of course, uh, adaptation, long-term adaptation is very important. Uh, it becomes a little bit problematic when you don't understand the future, so uh, you can't do things uh, if you don't, if the future's uncertain. So uh, the cooperation of grape growers, wineries, uh, or Grape Growers Association, or LCBO, all these people, all, or provincial governments, universities, colleges, all of them, the so-called crucial institutional uh, input in looking at the industry, all of which help to lay the long-term and short-term plans in terms of how the industry will evolve with the evolution of climate. And I thank you, Dave. And if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Oh. Any Good news overall on the precipitation but tough news on the climate change. The um, optimist in me on your uh, uh, slide number 14 might indicate that we're in for a good summer. <laughs> well, I would think so. <laughs> I'm hoping so. Um, thank you again, Tony. Did we have any questions? Um, I do have a, a small gift for you. Okay. Um, it's actually, it's a, no, it's it's a USB. Okay. And uh, thank you again. Thank you. Please join me and thank uh, Tony. Uh, next week on March the 16th, um, we have Andy Reynolds joining us. Um, Andy is a professor um, in biological sciences and also a Covey Fellow. And he's speaking to us on experiences with growth regulators on table grapes in Ontario. So that ought to be very interesting and we hope to see you all back. Uh, thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>